Pickle. Let's talk about randomness. Computers and randomness don't really match. After all, a computer can only follow very precise instructions. So, if computers need structure and logical sequences, how can they do random operations? And on top of that, how can we use these random operations to generate worlds that seem to make sense? In the world of computers, we have two kinds of random numbers. True random numbers and pseudo-random numbers. True random numbers rely on actual randomness occurring in the physical world, such as cosmic background radiation. Whether that truly is random or not is an entirely different question about the predictability of the universe, but this is not a physics channel and I'm not a physicist, so for our purposes let's just call it truly random. This is pretty much as random as we could possibly get using a computer, but it is quite impractical and actually way overkill for most purposes. Which is why the most common way to get these random numbers is to use pseudo-random number generators. The idea of pseudo-random number generators is to use some kind of formula which will generate a sequence of seemingly random numbers for us. For example, let's take something that seems to generate random numbers, such as pi. This will spit out a long sequence of random numbers. The only problem is the sequence it generates is always the same. So, to introduce some more randomness, we usually use some kind of seed for our random number generators. The seed is simply a number we feed into our generator, which would change something about the sequence of the numbers we get. So, for our little pi generator, let's say our seed determines where we start in the sequence. This means that if we use the same seed, we will get the exact same sequence of numbers every time. So, if we want random numbers every time we use our generator, we will need to use a different seed. Usually the current system time is used as a seed to get a different sequence every time we run our generator. Of course, in reality more complex and unpredictable formulas are used to get these random numbers. But the basic principle is the same. Get a seed, feed the seed into the formula and generate a sequence of numbers using the formula. With this we have our most important ingredient for procedural generation. Random numbers. Let's get some terminology out of the way. Because there is a difference between random generation and procedural generation. You'll find that random generation and procedural generation are often used interchangeably. But for our purposes we'll go with the definitions defined by Gamma Sutra. We have randomly generated games where the content is built from predefined elements. And we have procedurally generated content where the game builds entirely original content. Now that we know what we're talking about, how can we actually use our random numbers to generate elements in our games? Let's start with a game that mainly uses randomly generated elements. Binding of Isaac. In the Binding of Isaac, a dungeon is generated consisting of connected rooms through which the player can traverse. Dungeon generation in the Binding of Isaac works by stitching randomly picked rooms together. For example, we start with a default starting room. Next, we randomly select one of our four sides to place a room. And then we pick one random room from our collection of predefined layouts and place it down. We repeat this process until we have placed enough rooms and then finish up by placing a boss room somewhere. Finally, the game could do one extra stage where random elements are placed inside the room such as chests, items or special objects. This is all randomly generated, which means that the rooms themselves are all designed beforehand. The game just decides where and how to place this predefined content. This means that the game developers need to create a lot of content beforehand to make sure the game feels different every time you play. This system, however, is vastly different from procedurally generated content. For some games, making all of this content beforehand is either too much work or just plain impossible. This is why games like Minecraft and Terraria use an entirely different system to generate content. So now it's finally time to talk about procedural generation, where the game itself creates original content for the player to explore. But if we want to talk about procedural generation, we have to talk about noise. No, not that kind of noise. I'm talking about computer-generated noise, distortion patterns, and most notably, Perlin noise. Huh? What is Perlin noise? Well, it looks like this. Now you don't need to understand exactly how it's generated. The important bit is that it's randomly generated using some math formula and some specific rules which determine its characteristics. Okay, Digit, sure. That's a nice picture you showed with some random cloudy blobs. So what? Well, noise like this is often the basis for procedurally generated terrain. So, how do we use it? To understand how terrain generation works and how noise plays into it, 
Let's start with a 2D example, similar to how Terraria would generate its terrain. We'll start simple. Let's say that white pixels represent a filled space, such as dirt or grass, and black pixels represent an empty space. The first step in our terrain generation is to define the horizon. Ah, lovely. Nice and flat terrain. Makes me feel right at home. But of course, this is not an interesting world to explore. We need hills, valleys and mountains in our landscape. So it's time to introduce some offsets in our terrain. Let's just pick a number at random for each of our pixels and move them up or down by that amount. This should make our terrain a bit more interesting. Hmm. Well, that certainly looks more interesting, but it doesn't look like a realistic terrain at all. So how do we improve this? What could we possibly do to get more realistic terrain? What could possibly help us solve this problem? Ah, of course, our good old friend Perlin Noise. Instead of shifting our terrain around randomly, we use Perlin Noise to determine our offset. Similar to how the cloudy texture from before was generated, we can also use the same rules to generate a single one-dimensional slice of noise. This slice can be used to transform our terrain, where the color of a pixel in this slice determines how much we move a point up or down. For example, a white pixel moves a point 25% up, and a black pixel moves a point 25% down, and everything in between. This means the slice of Perlin noise we have describes our 2D height map. And because Perlin noise generates much smoother continuous patterns, our terrain actually starts looking realistic now. However, using this method, points can only move up or down. So this means that we will never get any overhangs or cliffs. So to fix this issue, we can do another pass with Perlin noise. But now, instead of shifting points up or down, we can shift them left and right. And this causes our terrain to deform a little bit, creating these nice cliffs and overhangs. The generation for these mountains and hills can be tweaked. For instance, we can choose how much our values in the Perlin noise move the points around. If we choose to move our points less, we get lower hills. And if we choose to move our points more, we get a more rough mountain area. But we can do more. We can play around with the generation of the Perlin noise itself. For instance, we can make the transitions between extreme values smoother to give us more gradual hills. In short, we can tweak all kinds of things, which will change the kind of terrain that is generated. We can even do more passes with different noise maps to make the terrain rougher. This can be used to define all kinds of areas and biomes to make our world more interesting and varied. Imagine placing multiple different biomes next to each other and already you're beginning to see the varied worlds we can create. So that generates our terrain above ground. But what about all the caves we can explore underground? Well, luckily we can reuse a lot of the same principles. Once again, we're going to need some kind of noise function to carve out our caves. Unfortunately, Perlin noise doesn't really give us the results we need for generating caves. Different noise generators use different rules and have different characteristics. So we've picked a different noise generator which gives us more cave-like patterns. To make these patterns into caves, once again look at the colors in our noise pattern. We can set a threshold value which determines when a part of our pattern is a cave. For instance, if we set a threshold of 80%, then anything above 80% whiteness will be considered a cave. The lower we set this threshold, the wider our caves will be. So to make our caves more interesting to explore, and to make sure they don't carve out these huge portions of our landscape, we can play with this threshold value. Remember that the lower this threshold, the wider our caves are. So if we decrease this threshold the deeper we go, Caves will get progressively wider and wider the further we go down. That's the basics of how a game like Terraria would procedurally generate its terrain in 2D. But how would this work in three dimensions for a game like Minecraft? Well, luckily pretty much the same principles apply to the 3D world. For instance, our Perlin noise from earlier can now be used in two dimensions. And just like in 2D, it simply describes the height of our map, but now in two dimensions instead of one. Brighter areas represent taller peaks, and darker areas represent the valleys. Now, if we would add some rules to this, say, adding snow above a certain height or water below a certain height, you can already see how this would define our world. If you've ever seen one of those augmented reality sandboxes, this should feel familiar. Except in this case, the sand is our Perlin noise map. Once again, if we want to add more details or make our terrain more rough, we can do multiple passes with this Perlin noise, 
each with a different weight affecting the final result differently. For generating our caves we can once again use the same noise generators as our 2D example. However, to get a nice looking 3D cave system we need to use two noise maps along two axes. To determine where the caves are we'll look at where these two noise maps intersect. By overlaying them like this we get a nice complex cave system with realistic looking tunnels and open areas. With the surface world and the caves done we should have a fairly interesting world to explore already. But there wouldn't be much to do without objects in this world. So the last pass of our world generation is placing objects all over our world such as plants, animals, enemies, treasure, villages, etc. To give you a general idea of how this would work, imagine that the placement of an object is always determined by its surroundings. We can go through our generated world and place objects based on certain rules. For instance, we'll say trees and grass always grow on the surface. Plants and flowers only grow in grass and bunnies can only spawn in areas with grass and flowers. Imagine a similar system for the caves where you would only spawn bats in caves with certain width, have lava at a certain depth or have blocks become different ores at different depths. These systems can become quite complex as designers would want to tweak the player experience and make the environment feel more realistic. Because of this, we won't go too in depth, but this should give you a general feel of how such systems could be constructed. Now the great thing about procedural generation is, you can create gigantic worlds without the need to handcraft at all. If you recall, the way randomness works on our computers means that with the same seed, we always get the exact same sequence of random numbers, like the sequence of pi that never changes. Because of this predictability of the random numbers, you can create near infinite worlds, even an entire universe without the need to store it all in your system's memory. You can see this in games like No Man's Sky. As long as you use the same system to generate your random numbers, you can be certain you get the same random numbers with the same input. This means that you can construct a system where the content that is generated is determined by its position in space, for example. Even if you leave and come back, the rules of your procedural generation never changed, which means it will generate the exact same content as the last time you visited. Since everything is generated on the fly, you can't really store the state of the world in a game like that. So, if you want players to change or add things to the universe, you would need to save the changes the player made in the world and reapply them when necessary. This allows players to change the world without the need to store an entire universe on your system. And that's the beauty of procedural generation. You write certain rules and procedures around the computer's random number generator, which gives you an infinite amount of unique worlds in accordance with your specifications. You don't even need to be able to store such a large world as long as the rules don't change. Albeit 2D, 3D, in space, on Earth, or on the water, the possibilities are endless. And isn't that wonderful? All of that through the magic of programming. I know it's been a lot to take in, and if you have specific questions, I'll try and answer them in the comments. And I promise I won't disappear for two years. I hope you've learned something new today, or at the very least, that you're a bit wiser.